आई वी एम So it's been another great week on IVM, and we're hoping that you enjoy all of the podcasts that we're being able to get out to you. As always, if you're not following us, please do follow us on IVM Podcasts on all the social media platforms. This week on Keeping It Queer, Naveen spoke to Ankit Das Gupta, the social media content manager at Mirror Now. On Who's Your Mommy, Veda discusses mom bods and the toll a pregnancy can take on women. On Vartha Lab, Akash and Naveen exchange stories with boys from the Bombay Hemp Company. On Pragati, Pawan and Hamsini are joined by Dr. Shambhavi Nayak to discuss the Nipah virus and discuss the nitty gritties of this new disease. On Simplified, Narayan and Chak break down the differences between schizophrenia and split personality on a shorty. It's been a really, really great week, and I hope that you're going to listen to all of these shows or at least some of them. In the meantime, let me get you onto this one. She quit her full-time corporate job to go on a short sabbatical, only to come back, fleshing out a lifelong dream of starting a restaurant. which promotes what conscious eating the concept behind her restaurant sequel is to offer wholesome cuisine with fresh high quality ingredients according to her health food need not be boring and she's trying to break the stereotype with her creativity Mind you she's not a trained chef but she has the passion to take anything she does to a completely another level I don't know if you know but she is among the few people whose wedding was covered by none other than the world famous Vogue magazine So welcome to the show Vanika Thank Vanika, you Vanika it's going to be a pleasure talking to you today learning yeah. about all the stuff you're doing It's going to be a pleasure talking to you too really excited to be here No no I I think uh, you know uh, going through the stuff you've been able to do and already your restaurant sequel is making headlines across the country it, it was you know listed as one of the best restaurants uh, in india yeah so would love to start with your journey how did this all start i mean how does a person you came from jammu yes uh <laughs> then starting in the corporate world to now starting a restaurant yeah. and being so good at it so How did this all start? So it started. I came to Bombay to study. Um, you know, I came to Bombay to study engineering. Two years into it, I realized that it was not for me. Decided to yes, absolutely boring. Really not cut out for it. I uh, decided to quit it two years into it. And at that time, my calling was advertising. So went and studied mass media. I did my specialization in advertising. Was placed without a form, which was going to be a media startup, and I thought it was really exciting to work with a startup company, uh, which was just funded by Three Eye. Um, started there as a management trainee in research and planning. Uh, was there for about ten years, um, and by the time I quit, I was the CEO of the company. Wow, and, uh, you that's know, quite a journey. Huh? Yeah, it was quite a journey. From a management trainee to the CEO. To, uh, yes, yes, and you know, considering I spent my entire career there, huge learning curve. because i did everything from research and planning to sales to strategy to business development and then to finance looking at all aspects of the business so so i think most of what i've learned is actually and, from and what was this company called out of home media it was it was a joint venture between ishan who founded it and 3i um so yeah so straight out of college joined them i was there for yeah 9 10 odd years and it was actually the transformation really started then uh, my calling was very clear it was you know it was advertising it was media and what i loved about my job then it was actually new media so you know you had to change people's mindset for them to buy into this media and that's what i loved about the job but you know somewhere like 4 5 years into it um it it started with a food allergy that i got you know i, I had some seafood i used to eat meat and then 13 years back so, i stopped eating so you know before we go into your food allergies and yeah. your food habits i want to actually go a little behind i want to go back to your days in jammu yeah you know how does a girl who grows up in a small city like jammu i presume kind of very small very conservative uh, you know and then coming to mumbai yeah. and then quitting engineering i mean i'm sure this would have created a lot of ripples in your little yes. mahalla somewhere yes so how yes. did that happen how did you end up in mumbai in the first place so uh, you know i mean if you if you know if you're from jammu and at least 20 years back um you have two career choices either you become a doctor or you become an engineer and there's really nothing else and my dad's a scientist and my mother's a housewife jammu's a very conservative place but 
I think the way we were brought up, my parents were very liberal. They were very clear they wanted me to go out to get educated because they were like, even if you do engineering here or you become a doctor, you know, all you can do is just go for a government job. And there's really, there are no other opportunities. I mean, now it's changed drastically, but not not while uh, I was growing up. And, and so, you have siblings? Or yes, you, okay. I have a brother. Yeah. And he went to study maritime engineering and my parents were very clear. They wanted to send me out and I wanted to go out and you know, if you're growing up in Jammu, there's very little exposure. I mean, technology came when, even after I moved out of Jammu. Um, and actually, they pushed me to go out. And especially my mom, even though she's a housewife, she's a very strong person. She's like, you know, you should go out there, be financially independent. And that's something that they ingrained in me since I was a and, kid. And I assume that being in Kashmir, you are also the Kashmiri Pandit or is Not that a Kashmiri different? Not Kashmiri Pandit. My mom's a Kashmiri Punjabi and my dad migrated after partition but we so actually where, where did he come from which part he came from Pakistan from Kotli okay. and so my grandfather migrated from Rawalpindi so oh, I wow. think it is possibly Close the world. same area yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my mother's actually from Kashmir and they had to leave Kashmir at the time of militancy. So from I was, Srinagar, they were in Srinagar. Srinagar, yes. So um, actually I was born in Jammu, but my mom couldn't stay in, in Jammu. She was very clear. She wanted to stay in Srinagar. She was like, I can't stay in this place. And then uh, just when I was a week old, we went back to Srinagar and I was there for about six, seven years of my life. And we just came in before the militancy started. Um so going in Srinagar is very different, you know, very outdoorsy, a whole lot of parks, so different from growing up in a city where all, you, you know, what is there to do over a weekend here? Or what do you do in the evenings? Whereas if you if you grow up there, you're completely in nature. And I think that's where I get my love for nature from. But having so, so said that... So you're saying that till you were about 10 years old, you were in Srinagar? No, or? till about I was seven years old. Seven I was years there, old. Six, seven. And oh. then I came to Jammu and then I was there till 18. And Jammu is very, very, very conservative. Uh, like I said, very limited in, in terms of choices. What do you go after school? You know, Anusha and I were having a conversation. Uh, there are no swimming classes or gymnastic classes or sports classes or you know singing Maybe classes you used to go to Katra and, Jau- <laughs> and Vaishnu Devi right no yeah exactly what do you you know you so you just go to these outdoor so, so places I have to tell you this one thing sorry to interject here so we were going to this Markha Valley trek yeah. and we decided where do we practice trekking so me and my wife went to Vaishnu Devi to tr- wow so we said you know what we are going to do we are going to land and uh, go to Katra and walk, up, walk up and walk to, down and yeah. we did that in like some 7 or 8 hours yeah. but yeah sorry yeah, so but I'm you, sure you've done that yeah, too yeah right? I've done it so many times and you know you grow up it's it's a very outdoorsy way. You're trekking. Your summer holidays are very different. It's not what happens so in a conventionally big city. And my memories of Jammu city. is the food there is very tasty, right? Yeah. Especially the, those paneer parathas. And, and the rajma chawal. The rajma chawal. And, it's uh, known for that, yeah. And there's also this, there's some kind of a fish which is also very Which good. is Himalayan trout, which is more towards Kashmir. Uh, which is also strictly rationed, but one of the best fish uh, that it's you rationed. get. Yeah, it is because uh, now, of course, people have started farming, but, you know, it's it's not there in abundance. So it's actually rationed, but it's it's one of the best fish available. So, yeah, it is kind of a, in in many ways, known for food, very different from... And, and your brother is older or younger? Yeah, older, 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 older yes. So you and him... Were literally the two people who, or you had other friends in Jammu? Or yeah, yeah, I had, I had a whole bunch of friends, but uh, like I said, you know, here probably after school you go for a whole bunch of classes with your friends, you know, like you would go for, let's say, a gymnastic class or you'll go to learn swimming. Now, those things really don't happen, you know, you, you literally with your books and or you meet your friends or like, like I said, you know, not when you are in, in Jammu, but you know, over the weekends you go trekking and stuff like that. It's it's very different. And but I also feel you're closer to nature, also very close to your family. You eat all your meals at least dinner. The whole family is together. Uh, so it's very different, completely, completely different from growing and up there in are lots Bombay. Lots of temples also in Jammu. Lots of temples. Yeah, Jammu is it's actually called a city of temples. Wow. Yeah, and Kashmir is called a city of parks. So if you are growing up there, you are very close to nature. You know. Amazing. So, I mean, you know, I have, 
it's it's somehow it's interesting that I have seen a lot of people, especially from Jammu. Yeah. I think mostly people leave the this the city, right? Because yes, after because what point, do you do? That's the thing. You know, my dad's a scientist. He he was earlier in Srinagar and then in Jammu, and then of course and he was which, traveling. The organization was RRL Regional Research Laboratory, which is affiliated to CSIR Central Scientific Industrial wow. uh, Institute. So, um, so you know, I mean, he could work there because he's a scientist. But you have to be either a scientist or a doctor or an engineer. Even today, there are not so many avenues, and mostly it's about the government jobs or. You know the private sector is just so but, niche there. But then, there. how Mumbai? Why not Delhi? Or you know, there are other places which would have been possibly closer. Yeah. But coming to Mumbai must be quite a decision. Right? It was quite a decision, and actually, the decision was taken by my parents. And my dad decided, you you know, you have to do engineering, and I was like, I don't think that's for me. You know, uh, even though I'm I am from JNK, but it was then that I knew I wanted to study mass media. Um, even though the exposure there is super limited. And that's why I was keen to come to Bombay, uh, you know, um, because I thought it was and the best. And you had any relatives or anybody? No, there? no relatives, nothing, you know. Wow. And uh, just decided to come here. And yeah, you get a bit of a culture shock. You know, you're but intimidated all, by these big... to your parents, right? Here we are talking of, you know, very conservative, you know, parents don't want to have the person leave the mohalla, forget yes. about the city. Yeah. And for them to send you or, you know, encourage you to yeah. go to Mumbai. It, this it was, was which big, year? This was what? This this was about uh, 15 years back. No, sorry, 17 years back. So 2001. Yeah, it was wow. long back. And like I said, you know, my parents, they ingrained in this in me since I was a kid that you have to be financially independent. You know, no matter what you do in life, whether you decide to get married, not get married, whatever your life choices are, you have to be financially independent. And they were the ones who were very clear. They wanted, actually my mother, who wanted to push me out of the house when I was 18 um, to go out there, study, decide what I wanted to do. And uh, and actually, I'm glad that I came to Bombay so that then, I mean, two years into engineering, I decided to do mass media, which was my know, calling this then. This is not not many girls in this no. country. My, my parents were like, right? really questioned, why would you do that? You know, the normal thing would be, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, you should get married and then depend on your, you know, get, yes, let's get yeah. you a good husband type of a thing, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the cliche. Of course, it's changing, but, but that is that, this no, that's thousand... still the cliche. But my parents were very clear. If my brother is going out to study, I have to go out to study, you know. Um, so it's actually, yeah, it's it's to do with them that, you know, I came to Bombay. And, uh, yeah, they were questioned a lot for this decision. Nobody could understand why they were taking a decision like this, to be very honest. And then you joined engineering. Yes, I joined. And which in, college was this? This was a college, Datta Mege in Airoli. And two years into it, I mean, I couldn't Airoli, even get that through. that time was like a dump, right? It was I like thought the middle it was nowhere. worse than Jammu, you know. It was the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it was worse than Jammu. It was not and Mumbai. <laughs> you can't say you were in Bombay at all if you were there, actually. And then from there, I went to Jai Hind, which is South Bombay, ah, which is completely... There. Yeah, you were in the middle of Marine Drive, right? You were at the Katta there. <laughs> yeah, completely different. But yeah, it was also a bit intimidating in the beginning. You know, when you're from small town, you come to such a big place. Yeah, but Datta Meghi would have been, oh, what the advertisement <laughs> and the real product was like, oh God, you know. Too much of a disconnect. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't know how to stay in small hostels or flats. Because, you know, I mean, out there it's so different. You have big open spaces which you don't see in the city. And you kind of get intimidated. You get a bit of a culture shock. So, yeah. So, at what time did you decide that I'm going to quit engineering? Because It was in my second year. I told my parents and my parents were like, no, you have to finish engineering. After that, you want to do MBA. You want to study marketing. You do that. And I was like, no. You know, I want to do it now. And my mother was actually quite supportive. So she's like, okay, if you want to quit now, now is the time Do you recall that day when you told them, you know what, from tomorrow onwards? (laughs) I was like, uh, I went home. I said, you know, uh, and the admissions were just about to open. There was an entrance exam uh, for a whole bunch of these colleges. And I said, I'm going to sit for an entrance exam. And if I get through, I'm going to join. And my dad was like, no way, you're not going to do that. And my mother is like, you know, she was like, okay, if you really want to do it, and if you think you're going to excel in this, then go for it. And she was actually the supportive one. Like I said, even though she's a housewife, she's been very supportive of all the choices I've made. She's a very strong-willed person, has always pushed me to be financially oh, I, I, I must say that, you know, you also were very clear on what you yes, want. Because was, normally people... You know, because of the parental pressure or whatever, yeah, people study yeah. and spend 
the rest of the life doing whatever they don't want, want to, to do. do. I've been very strong headed from the beginning. And I think early on I wanted I I knew what I want and I was like, you know, I just need to stick to this. If I've decided to do this, no matter what, I'm going to do it. I'm I'm actually that way quite a strong headed person. Uh so yeah, so I I went for it and uh, I decided to do my specialization in advertising and then started And that working. was in Jehan. That was in Jehan. And then then there was no looking back and, and from an engineering background was it easy to like suddenly cope up with all this advertising No, job? actually I loved it. You know, I loved it. Um at that time like I said that was my calling then, you know. I loved it. I loved uh, you know everything that came on to, with it like the whole concept of studying marketing which you can't even imagine if you're in jammu i mean like i said you either you are an engineer or you're a doctor there are literally no other avenues now now also you know there are no colleges where you can study mass communication or you could study marketing and stuff like that it's it's very different um but yeah I, i sort of identified with what i was studying and i thought it would take me in the right direction so and why jai hind then why not Other so uh, no so i actually uh, went for my entrance exam and the first call i w- got was from jai hind and after your entrance exam they take a one on one interview and uh, when i went for my one on one interview i was actually really happy with the faculty out there and uh, you know the way they questioned me um and they were also very intrigued that this girl from jammu is going to come and study here and also the kind of personal interest that they south do. bombay like <laughs> girl from jammu coming to south yeah. bombay via airoli or whatever exactly <laughs> so uh, you know the day i went for my interview i was like you know i'm just going to join this you know and i decided to yeah no oh, that must be quite a call but Yeah I'm but I'm really you glad that. I yeah. took that call because I think if I had not taken that call at that time I don't know what I would have been doing today maybe doing some back office no, desk job somewhere It's amazing that I know many guys who have not been able to do this right and we have done so many you know sessions on our podcast where there yeah. are guys who studied they didn't want they even took up like Shantanu Moitra even worked for Citibank for the longest time before he then He's started his to. music career yeah. right i mean you were so clear that the minute you realized that this is not the path you That's, changed it so yeah. that was that was quite impressive yeah. and then you said that after finishing your mba you did your no no i just did my specialization in advertising not specialization in, in advertising, advertising yeah uh, you got placed day. from campus in yeah, this yeah because new i had startup. interned with euro rscg mm-hmm. uh, and you know ishan was the ceo then so they they placed me at that time yeah. and it was my first so job so there's ishan and prabhakar there right prabhakar is the other guy the no Pra- prabhakar used to be there yeah. long back So I I think he joined Percept yeah, or yeah. something yeah he was there long back. So I've met Ishan and a bunch the three co-founders of Euro RSC here. He was the actually the real co-founder and then yeah. everybody joined later you know Suman and a whole bunch of these people yeah. So you were at Euro and then you said you I was, I was doing my so you know uh, you have to do your summer internship. So I did my summer internship in VGC. I did it thrice in Euro. What is VGC? We are just in Italy. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So that was my first year. She's one of the most creative spurs. Yes, creative, she is creative. clearly. Yeah. yeah, and doing some amazing work. Even at that time, you know, yeah. like The Times of India was one of our big campaigns. Yeah, I even at that, that time they were doing amazing stuff for Aditya Birla. I don't know who handles the account right now, but yeah, it's doing some superb uh, stuff. So yeah, so that's how I got placed uh, at out of form and the reason the job excited me because i loved research so and planning from out of form from, is this hoardings and no, these digital displays no it's actually the, the digital screens inside you see them in the elevator banks not the hoarding so the hoarding is the more conventional part this is the unconventional with which actually um This was a joint venture between 3i and Ishan. The strategic uh, aspect of it actually came from China. This company called Focus Media started by this guy Jason in 2005 if I'm not mistaken. Uh no, I think yeah, maybe 2005 something. I I don't remember the exact year. So you know, he used to run this small creative agency in Shanghai. And he had this idea from all his travels because China is such a different market uh that he wanted to put these digital screens in the elevator banks so he's like where is it that in this time and age where people are so hard pressed for time that they spend 5 to 8 minutes on an average uninterrupted and that is literally the in the elevator bank you know and you wouldn't believe he put five i don't know because now i'm completely out of touch with what's happening but i'm talking about data which is 3 and a half years old but at that time he had 500000 screens in uh, just between shanghai and beijing wow 
and um, he started the company and within 5 years of that he listed it on nasdaq you know china is insane it's Do completely it's it's, it's another planet it's not a country it is another planet and uh, that's how this thought came to actually um, 3i that there should be something like this in india and ishan was just going to step down uh, from Euro as the CEO. And they went to him and they were like, why don't we do this JV? We'll bring all the strategic planning from China. Um, And then my role was research and planning to work with the China office um, first to understand everything that goes into... So you spent a lot of time in Shanghai, I presume. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, also understanding how it's done. Uh, The basic research and planning, which the same tools we got to India, started working with the Nielsen company, did a whole bunch of research uh, to put together a metrics for selling. And um, yeah, so actually it was, I started with research and planning. And at that time, that really excited me, you know, the whole aspect of uh, how to put together the metrics for a new media so it's these screens in the elevator banks, not the not the conventional. So there were this other company also was doing it. If I'm not mistaken, Den or Den or something. No, Den no, was something. No, else. there was live media. Live media. Yes, yeah. And now the, Times of India also does something. Times of India does it. They but they are uh, in prominent places like the airports. Airports. Okay. So for example, Focus started with this. They are also uh, doing the the airports. So they okay. also have these big screens. Uh, so as a like management that. trainee. Uh, you went all the way to becoming the CEO of that yeah. company. During how did, my last year, last How year did that now. happen? Like that's quite a jump, right? It's, yeah. it's not that. It's not easy. I think the only reason it happened is because I strongly believed in that media as compared to conventional media. I mean, how much of time do we all spend watching television? Netflix has happened now. I'm not talking about the last three years, but conventional. TV and therefore consuming advertising. I mean, people like you and I, I mean, we don't have that much of time to watch television and watch all the ads. So, you know, my belief really came from that, that you need a new media which talks directly to consumer, which is uninterrupted. Uh, So one, I really believed in it. And it happened because I gradually started from research and planning. They moved me to the Delhi office because that's where maximum business came from so all the clients from Hyundai to Citibank to General Motors to Maruti they were all there to GSK then I started working on specific categories I was given a task to put together the F&B category and we didn't have any F&B client on board and I actually managed to get Reckitt Benkiza, HUL, GSK everybody on board with really high billings. And what was your pitch to them? Why would they... My pitch to them was that, you know, you're spending these millions on conventional TV advertising and it does work for them. But if you look at the data that we have from Nielsen, which actually tells you the time people are spending on television versus the time people are spending on the LCD screens that we have. And then we were working with Nielsen on specific... um, campaigns, let's say if uh, Dettol advertised with us, what was the recall value of the Dettol ad on our medium as compared to what so it you, is you, on television? It's interesting. So I was recently, I think, on India Bulls Towers. Yeah. And in their elevator, going as some 18th floor, they have floor, their own... Uh, they have this thing with this new ad of Dhoni. Uh, so I actually never saw that ad. It's the first time I saw that ad in the elevator. Yes. And I remembered it and only now I saw it on some IPL or somewhere and I was yeah. like, oh, you know what? The first time I saw this so ad the, was not yeah. on TV. Because, yeah. you know, it's only in the elevator that it's completely uninterrupted. Exactly, and, you know, yeah. it's And you're it's trying to captive. actually look at the number and they place the yeah. screen right there. Yeah. So the whole idea was that here we have this set of captive audience. How can we get you on board to well, convey you know, the message you know in the right format? using elevators, like the elevator pitch, yes. which also came <laughs> up, right? That how can you pitch an idea? 30 second ele- spiel, yeah. 30 second spiel. So yeah. this was like literally creating an elevator pitch of your brand. Right. Yes. And while the person is in the elevator, how can you seal the deal? Exactly. So yeah, that that was our pitch but, to but them. But how did they measure this? Because I think measuring something like measuring this... Measuring would... something like this is very... Uh, it is tough. But we were working with Nielsen on one-on-one campaign. So if the billings were above a certain amount, we used to commission this research from Nielsen where they would actually track they would do the exit interviews, you know, which would be quantity interviews, not qualitative. And they would actually do the entire brand recall study. So we would get the footfall. So how then, many people entered the lift, exited the lift? And how many people re- remembered? There used to be a sample size, small, big, but 
at least adequate as to what uh, you know the study was and uh, and measuring the entire impact of the campaign so i started with this i think because i was working in research and planning i was really convinced as to why this media works and so i started accompanying the sales team for the pitches because i used to yep. uh, you know do the research pitch so uh so it started with that so i started with research and planning and then they decided they wanted the sales team to work with me on all this um because you were able to convince the clients because of your research exactly. so it was not the sales, sales team but exactly. it was the so then i started working on specific categories and fmcg was totally against this media two years into the company they had not even got on board or even done a small experiment and then three big clients some of the best clients in the country came on board with huge billings and, uh, and how did they pay for this ad is it like per elevator or no per... so the, no no so we had uh, you know we had a rate card which used to be per um, per 10 seconds so, so literally like fct you were yeah, selling completely FCT. yeah 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 completely and very scientific way of uh, selling it very transparent so you get to see everything mm-hmm. on an excel um so yeah so once they started giving me these specific categories after that they, they told me to work on finance and so it all started from there even i didn't know when i became a part of the you major... also worked in finance no i mean uh finance category so they told me no the you know category. yeah okay. i was like oh god they have made started making you do financial books <laughs> no, of the company no, thank god that was only one job i didn't do and then because of all this i started working with the content team to create content for these brands you know because it's going to be a 30 second spiel so how do we create ads which are just 20 seconds 25 seconds you know short which work well for this medium we don't want to bo- and how many screens were there did you find uh, so by the time i quit there were about 7000 screens 7000 yeah wow. which is very small as compared to the to china half a million, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but you know I, i mean this medium has a huge potential to grow but then I you have to have somebody who's going to the number of skyscrapers speak. now yeah. i think uh, yeah it's i mean we had so for us what was working well is these small micro markets you know gurgaon was a micro market we had about 800 screens only in gurgaon and you know if you if you because i worked in gurgaon for about 6 7 years if 7 you, years in yeah, gurgaon yeah. god but i used to shuttle all the time but if you are in gurgaon you live in gurgaon yeah, it's like you know, your own microcosm you, you don't get it. out of gurgaon at all so you know we had a screen in their house we had a screen in their office building we had a screen in their gym so we were literally covering all touch points because the whole idea is that one is this captive audience and then targeting him through these multiple and, and touch points and did you points. pay rent to these buildings to put yes, the screen yeah, in yes yeah we put okay. we paid rent at some point i started working on the bpd aspect also working with dlf and a whole lot of other players on the negotiation of the deals so you know after covering all God, these you, aspects you're brilliant what all i mean you are like the master of every trade right right from market research to doing yeah. all of this wow. i think but it it's it is because i did market research for a long time that i was working across verticals but you've not seen market researchers go i mean normally you have seen sales people people yes who are or maybe creative now in a lot of agency yes. types where you know you have either sales or creative but you know getting people market. from research is is, is yeah. quite a yeah. so you've been an outlier all your life literally yeah, yeah yeah i've always wanted to do the unconventional out of the box and everybody is like what are you doing here you can join television you know you'll be working on on a brand that everybody knows not out of home media that people haven't even heard about and yeah. i was Naam like uska <laughs> o hai o ye o kya hai ha huh? yeah <laughs> like, and i was like no i want to stick to this you know? so yeah and you were in that company for almost 10 years yes for almost like from the inception Yeah. So yeah. But yeah, what changed? What like after ten years you became the CEO and you left? I mean that doesn't so matter. So no, I'll tell you what changed is that you know I had this um, food allergy. They 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 actually didn't manage to figure out what it was. I used to eat meat, which I stopped thirteen years back, and then I became a pescatarian. Now I don't even eat that. But um, I had pescatarian is, is fish. Fish, yeah. Okay. So I used to eat only seafood, no meat or anything else. Uh so I had seafood once uh, you know about I think this is about this is long back 7 8 years back um and then I went to work the other day I had a whole bunch of meetings I wasn't feeling well I was breathless I was itchy and I didn't know what was going on with me I went home in the night I couldn't sleep you know I I realized I was getting hives all over my body I went to my I had to go to the doctor at 6 o'clock in the morning the next day and he's like 
just rushed to breach Kenny. I'm going to be there in 10 minutes. You need to get hospitalized. I was like, what, what is happening to me? And he's like, you're getting hives all over your body. We need to give you steroids. They were literally giving me steroids for a week. Every time they would put a steroid, I used to be fine for three hours. And then the whole bunch of hives would come back, you know. Wow. And, um, and then it was so bizarre that the doctors were not willing to discharge me without an EpiPen. And I was like, he's like, wherever you travel, whichever part of the world, this EpiPen has to be in your bag and we'll give you a prescription to carry this because you can't carry it on flights. And with that came this huge stress and fear that, you know, I mean, one, I've been on steroids for low, so long. And secondly, they told me very clearly I had to take that medication for six months. Wow. And somebody who's always been fit, I obviously put on uh, 10 kgs. And at the back of my mind was this question, why can't the doctors figure out that what caused this reaction rather than just giving steroids to basically suppress it, you know, which is the conventional Welcome case. to the world of medicine. They yes, are, they yeah. are in the business of giving you a pill for everything. Exactly. You know, rather than identifying the cause. The cause and yeah. then, you know, that really kind of bothered me. And I actually carried the EpiPen with me wherever I traveled in the world. Yeah. And then three, and then I, I was literally taking a medicine every single day. The allergies were so bad. Um, I couldn't sleep without uh, taking the allergy medicine. And then, you know, one day, I don't know where I was. I decided to throw the EpiPen. I was like, if this remains in my bag, I'm literally living with the fear that I'm going to inject myself with it every time. And this just happened. There's no. They no could not of identify. This no, nothing. No, Suddenly, I, one fine day, this happened. I ate seafood and I was eating for such a long time and I got these massive hives all over my body. Massive, massive reaction. Um, and then the day I threw my EpiPen, I said, you know what? I'm going to start gymming. I, I was already into gymming, but I'd never done yoga before. I said, I'm going to start doing yoga. Um, I'm going to, st I was never a junk eater, but I said, I'm going to be very conscious of what choices I make. I'm going to start eating organic, if not organic, at least natural, eating a balanced diet, which is a lot of whole foods rather than foods that are processed. So it just became as a personal journey after the food and allergy. you decided this on your own. Nobody, Nobody no told, me. told you no. or you didn't read any book. I didn't read any book. I just decided to do this myself. The only book I read is about yoga and meditation. And I said, you know, I need to get into yoga like full time. I need to do a yoga class every day. Before that, I'd never practiced yoga. So I started uh, going for yoga classes. And I realized how much it actually helped me. And even with the work stress that I was dealing with. Uh, and then, you know, the more I got into this, this soon became my lifestyle. I was eating organic. I was throwing a whole bunch of you know, dinners, brunches, parties at my home, which was food like this, you know, basically the food that is at sequel right now. And everybody was like, and I had never cooked before. I had never literally entered my kitchen ever before. And my mother's an amazing cook, but I never actually learned from her, you know, because I moved out of my house when I was uh, 18. And, you know, I'm 35 right now. So I never literally cooked with my mother. And I decided to eat organic. I started cooking a lot of whole foods, eating predominantly gluten-free and refined sugar-free at home decided to cut sugar this out of my life five years when was this almost? this was about seven years seven back. years back. yeah, yeah. Uh, decided I didn't want to eat sugar like to this day I mean from seven years there has not been a refined sugar packet in my house ever eating completely gluten-free nobody told me I decided For everybody to listening sugar is poison complete stop poison, having it toxin <laughs> don't have it throw it out Fruits look at it fruits are better dates yes, are better exactly honey is, honey is better right? honey is better yes. have yeah. maple syrup yeah. have uh, coconut sugar if you want but I mean don't refined sugar, sugar is toxic don't sugar have it bad. yeah don't okay, touch yeah. it that was our little <laughs> yeah. little way to spread uh, sweetness exactly <laughs> considering the number of people People that get diagnosed with diabetes in this country and people still don't want to have that wake up call and same here I don't remember the last time I've added sugar, sugar. into anything I mean yeah. no, you know so I don't have it in any of the f uh, food or drinks of course yeah. you know sometimes if you're eating a biscuit or something it's okay yeah. but I don't add sugar into anything yeah. and you, you know you need to take these small steps towards a positive better healthier lifestyle but it all starts with these so I started taking these small steps and I realized how much of a difference it made then I think a year and a half into it I lost all the weight that I'd put on um, 
and most importantly i was not taking any medicine for my allergies you know uh and now also sometimes on and off i get some reaction but i just you know my body just processes yeah. it i've not taken any allergy medicine in the in so, so it's many interesting years. so last year i spent time with dr gundry yeah. dr gundry has written this amazing book called the plant paradox the yeah. and what he talks about is that you know normally we only think of allergies with you know seafood or nuts it's but everything. actually everything Thing in the causes. world yeah. has its own defense mechanism every yeah. plant every vegetable every fruit has its different mechanism yeah. and every time you consume it it actually it has is, an impact on your body is, and yeah. he talked about s- certain vegetables like tomatoes yeah. uh which he says you just should not be having, having because tomatoes, uh yeah. they are having and he talks about a lot but i mean i was shocked about some of the stuff he talked about and he talks about this thing called lechins i think yes, lechins yes lechins which people use a lot you know that's what when i tell people don't eat food that is highly processed Th- this is what i mean by it people look at these chocolates which are made with raw cacao but they 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 don't see that at the back of the pack it has lechins it has emulsifiers which are very bad for your body you know uh, so don't have that but you know the consumers are not just aware of these fine so his whole concept was if you're eating any of this kind of fruits and vegetables or even meat which yeah. is having allergic reaction to your your body is only fighting it and not absorbing any nutrients yes. so uh, yeah. your body is under constant stress and that is to what to actually is- digest it that's what causes a lot of inflammation in your gut and that's when you i mean that's that's how basically you start getting all these digestive and, and, issues and gut back and it's finally all about the bacteria and it's all these all about things the are bacteria. destroying the bacteria yeah yeah you know you there there is the friendly bacteria in your body i mean the prebiotics and the probiotics so another thing which actually um it all came from reading traveling observing what people were doing in different parts of the world another thing that i was on steroids for such a long time and it it upsets me to this day that nobody told me that along with these steroids you know you're also having antibiotics you need to have probiotics nobody told me this you know Now uh, I went to study a uh, culinary nutrition last year at NGI and I mean I studied these things on my own you know 4 5 years back and I I I mean this is they teach you at the school but I I remember studying it also so every time you take antibiotics basically the friendly bacteria in your gut gets washed away with those antibiotics so it's it's actually mandatory that you take a probiotic. probiotic with it you know if a doctor is not giving you a probiotic supplement you need to have f- food sources like sauerkraut for example you need to incorporate that in your diet at least four times a week to get that but nobody tells you these things you know and that is my problem with the system in general that i think the problem is that see people are all looking for shortcut solutions in yes. themselves right so yeah. they're like oh i have this problem give me a pill and yeah. fix it so yeah let me take a i want a quick 30 minute fix i don't want to you know to go through this Same and stuff like that antacid right yes. antacids are one of the highest selling drugs because and they people are, are just, just so terrible yeah. for your body people don't realize that that every time they put you on antacids they don't tell you what is the cause you know what is causing all these reactions in your digestive system they just want to quickly fix it you know and it's not only about the doctors i'm also talking about the consumers they don't want to find out what is causing this whole reaction you know maybe there's inflammation maybe there's something in your gut you know maybe there can be a whole maybe you have a whole bunch of food intolerances that you don't know about like you spoke about the book everybody has intolerances it's just that you don't know about them um so yeah so i was like why does nobody i mean why do you not know these things and that's how i got into fermentation big time started making my own kimchi sauerkraut and we make all these things uh, from scratch at sequel because we don't want to buy bottled preserved stuff um so yeah it all just started with a episode that i had of food allergies and i've not taken literally any medicine after that for any of my food allergies and you know i just decided to eat food that's completely organic a lot of whole foods and where were you sourcing large... this before you started sequel as an individual way yeah so this? so you know the produce i would just buy i would go to the farmers market for example or i would just see the produce that you get in markets and some you know if you know it's organic that's how i actually um decided i wanted to work with offerings because i saw some of their produce in food hall and i took the produce and i had it and i was like i have literally not tasted baby carrots like this and um 
I I decided to just pick up the phone, call them. Didn't manage to find their number. Went onto their website, sent them a long email that I'm starting this restaurant. I don't know when, where, how. I've not even finalized the place. <laughs> But I'm going to buy your your produce for that. Yeah, and then we decided to have our own poly house because we wanted to be completely farm to folk. So I was buying these things there, and then other things like, for example. cacao for example or for raw chocolate which is just literally made of three ingredients water raw cacao and uh, natural cane sugar there's absolutely nothing else that goes into it i would just buy all these things uh, whenever i was traveling i would pick them up from whole foods all the nuts saffron spices i was bringing from kashmir because i am from there and you know i i told myself when i was ideating on this that if i'm going to start this it's literally going to be an extension of what i use in the kitchen and everything that's used it's it's the same that i was using when i was eating like this at home completely there's um, zero compromise on that the vishal gondal show will be right back after this break long long ago not in bethlehem but in a place nearby There was a wonderful birth of a huge show which I like to call Cyrus says a show that encapsulates everything in human history from the first homo sapien to the last homo sapien uh, who's traversed the entire world and then come back to India this is a show which tells you everything about everything if you want to know avoid google come to us it's called Cyrus says get new episodes every monday and thursday on the ivm podcast app website or wherever you get your podcast from it's simple as a b oh god what comes up Cyrus says is brought to you by Setu Your Gut. We want to know how did you start Sequel from being an advertising professional to now jumping in this whole world of health food and setting up this restaurant. Um so like I said you know I've been eating like this at home for about 7 years started as a reaction to the food allergy I had once because of seafood and then that's when I decided to make a conscious switch towards what I was eating started eating organic a lot of whole foods completely gluten free at home completely refined sugar free food that's minimally processed um it started with that and you know wherever i traveled different parts of the world whether it was cape town it was hong kong it was new york i was so inspired by the food scene there in terms of the health food restaurants which focused a lot on the plant based diet and i said to myself why is there nothing like this in india and you know i wanted to quit my job um towards the last year and a half uh, of my corporate life and i wanted to start this but um you know just the idea of starting a food concept which is so niche to the country um we are one of its kind restaurant in india completely gluten free there is no restaurant like that completely farm to fork refined sugar free it takes a lot of conviction um i wasn't sure if the market is ready for it at the same time i really believed in this concept um but i just wasn't sure that if i should get out of my comfort zone which was the corporate job you know the the cushy salary that you get at the end of every month the bonus that you'll get at the end of every year and starting from scratch um and just then my friends had set me up uh, with dhawal who i'm now married to uh, and also i was feeling too stagnant in my corporate so, life so so at what point of time you decided to quit your career you, because you're not a trained chef or anything absolutely right absolutely I mean, not from being a corporate world and then yeah. suddenly opening a restaurant which is yeah. about you know gluten free organic yeah. healthy food so which is what i was coming to so it was about 3 and a half years back uh, Three years back, and uh, you know, I felt I was getting too stagnant there. I needed to do something different. I had this idea in mind. I wanted to put together this concept, but I was just not sure if I should, you know, get out of the corporate world and start this. I thought maybe I'll do it five years later. Um, so just at that time, I decided to take a short sabbatical for about six months and join Deutsche Messe as you know to look after their India business. I negotiated a six-month sabbatical from them, and they agreed. and you know during the sabbatical i made a list of everything i wanted to do so i i was trekking in the himalayas i did a yoga teacher's training i spent a lot so of time like made with, a bucket list yeah almost, i made huh? a i made a bucket list i said i'm going to do everything which i because i don't know when i'm going to have 6 months off you know i spent a lot of time with my boyfriend getting to know him we had just started seeing each other and uh, you know he told me why do you want to go back to the corporate world just like everybody does in the world why don't you start this thing that you really believe in and i said you know what if i fail 
He's like, if you fail, you fail. You know, there's only one way to find out. Just go for it. Pick up the phone. Say no to the job you're going to start in in Jan, um, 2016, um, and oh, start so not, this. Not too long back. No, not too long back. And uh, June 2015 is when I quit my corporate job. And, uh, you know, I wasn't convinced. But the more time I spent with myself, a lot of soul searching, I decided to say no to the job just literally four weeks before joining them. And I decided to work on this. So I had a short gap for about three months where I put together the financial resources, the, the plan I had. I did recipe testing every day. I did food trials, started work, looking at spaces. And then we started SQL two years back um, yeah, so just I think four months after all this um, started SQL and the whole idea was to share my journey because this is literally an extension of my lifestyle, you know, so to educate people about why should you eat organic, why should you follow a largely plant-based diet, uh, eating food that's minimally processed, eating food that's completely gluten-free and refined sugar-free and and the health benefits it can have. Yeah. And at the time of starting SQL, there were not many restaurants like this. So yeah. weren't you a little afraid? I mean, you'd want to go with the tried and tested, tested right? Yeah. I mean, normally when you start yes. restaurants, especially in Bandra, right? Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, which is filled with all the amazing restaurants. All the amazing restaurant food joints just pretty much everywhere. You know, that that's the battle I had in my head. Should I go with tried and tested? But that was not what I believed in. And that's not how I eat, you know. For me, it was very clear. It had to be an extension of my lifestyle. It had to be about my beliefs and about the health journey that I have been on. So, uh, you know, I decided to take the risk. There were a lot who said, you know, this concept is going to be amazing. There'll be a lot of takers for it. And at the same time, everybody's like, you want to do health food? It's so damn boring. Who's going to eat at your restaurant? Um, but, you know, I said... I think all it takes is a lot of determination, a winning mind and, and courage. And practicing what you preach. I think in your exactly. case, since you were completely into that I was diet. completely into it. And then, uh, you know, my friends, my family, my boyfriend back then, now my husband, super supportive. And they just pushed me to do it. And, and I'm so glad that I actually decided to not go back to the corporate world and start this. And at the time of starting the restaurant, you know, there's a very interesting story on this name sequel, right? Yes. I and mean, how did that happen? So I was working with a friend of mine, Salil, uh, on the branding aspect uh, of it. And I just couldn't figure out the names. You know, I wanted some quirky name or or actually names that actually go with the food concept. But I just couldn't come up with anything. And he said, okay, you know, I'll work on the naming aspect. And then one day he sent me a whole bunch of names and there was sequel in it. And then, you know, he had this whole description that this is the part two of your life, which is giving up the corporate world, starting a food journey that you've been passionate about for five, six years, but you've just not done it in such a long time and then it can also be a part two for people's eating habits like giving up sugar following largely a plant-based diet or eating organic small things like reading the back of the labels you know making all these conscious choices and then I I read the name and I decided I said this is it you and know, you know I, now in in today's world spider-man 2 and given all the sequels dead two, yes. two, so the sequels are always better than the first exactly, movie right so yeah. I think it kind of adds it's, to that yes it adds to it and I'm glad I picked this name and and how did you pick the location who you know because again picking up a location yeah. in such an area would have been another challenge it itself. was a huge challenge so you know uh, it was actually December 2015 when I'd said no to the job I started working on it full swing made a list of brokers that I was going to work with who, you know who showed me a whole bunch of places I was very clear to begin with I wanted to be in Bandra to make it more accessible for the audience that's young and also health conscious you know from that perspective Bandra really fits the bill and um, I saw a whole bunch of places I saw this place where we are right now and it used to be a cake shop nothing like what sequel <laughs> is and it was so different from what it is right now and that but lane is filled with, with all the yeah, junk restaurants yeah, like there's is. like there's a burger yeah. there's a McDonald's there's, there's a there's Burger everything. King and there's yeah. all of that right so I I walked into the space just the moment I walked into the space and even though it was completely different I could visualize transforming it you know and I told you Viraj who, was, who I was working with on the space I said this is it you know uh, I think I'm just going to go ahead uh, and finalize the space so I just walked into it could actually visualize transforming it and yeah and uh, 
the menu you know yes. once again it is a very different menu completely different yeah how did you choose that and you know what was the process which so, went into uh, the it? menu it is just exactly the way i eat at home so this is literally what i've been eating at home for the last 6 7 years uh, this is what i spent a lot of time recipe testing um, so it was it was just about uh, what i eat what i think is super nutritious at the same time delicious we don't want to compromise on the taste also uh, so the menu just came from what i was eating you know and what i thought the consumers would love and we've actually had great feedback and then also uh, you know the 3 months i did a lot of trials uh, the space was not ready but literally there were people at my at a house every single night uh and you then know which were the best dishes which came from your house's kitchen right to the sequel menu uh a lot of smoothies there's a peruvian cacao smoothie which literally is my smoothie every morning or the super green smoothies what i have so this also came so what from is the, the what is a super green smoothie super green smoothies basically avocado spinach uh cucumber all of this pressed together with chia seeds and raspberries wow. um and and fennel so most of the juices is what i used to have the cold pressed juices what i used to have at home even all the salads you know because i largely follow a plant based diet i don't eat cheese i used to make my own uh, vegan cheese at home and do the salad bowl called energy bowl uh, so everything is literally what i ate at home but these are some of the most popular items the energy and, bowl and did, i presume you also had a lot of failed recipes too which en- ended yeah, up there which ended up being in the dustbin yeah a lot of you know because i also love to bake so everything that's you know that's in the dessert is what how i would bake at home which is with raw cacao with nuts and seeds because we don't use uh, gluten and also because you're not using gluten that doesn't mean you start eating you know a lot of starchy stuff or high fatty stuff or cooking with tapioca flour the whole idea was to use alternative nutritious grains like buckwheat and brown rice flour so i you know a whole bunch of those desserts then there were some desserts which are really bad which never saw which never came on the menu like i made some sweet potato cakes and i don't know what all which was which is a bit of a disaster but since you were not a trained chef yeah. how did you pick up all these things because this is what takes a long time in culinary yes. school to yes. pick up right literally yeah. I think it came naturally to me of course I there's a whole range of books that I have that I referred to but I don't like to stick to any recipes I just when I'm in the kitchen I just want to create things by myself you know so while the inspiration could come from something it actually certainly came from my travels a lot uh but then once I'm in the kitchen I just look at the ingredients that are in the fridge and then I put together something yeah wow so that's literally experimenting yes, on the go it is experimenting yeah but again this was not you know uh, investing in a restaurant requires yeah. finances yeah. requires marketing requires it's not just about you know getting a few dishes together yeah. so how much time did it took you to put all this thing together so uh, before i started sequel the whole exercise from Uh, the financial resources the putting together the plan of it looking at the spaces doing recipe testing every day um it was about 5 odd months working with the farm uh, you know so it was about 5 odd months but you know i i'm also somebody who puts a lot of pressure once i decided that my sabbatical is over i said i don't want to spend the next one year just fine tuning the plan and the menu you know i want you know there are 24 hours in each day i just want to make everything happen in those you know so yeah i just went i went and for and how did the first set of customers walk into the restaurant how uh, did the you market the first set of customers walked in um, a lot from you know we started the social media account i think uh, a couple two weeks probably before we launched uh vogue came for a tasting um because they wanted to feature us in one of the new restaurant that was opening and uh you know they wrote actually some amazing stuff about sequel then brown paper bag came they wrote a nice review and then pretty much everybody came and was reviewing the restaurant and then we were covered in mostly all the publications so that's how actually the first set of customers came it was completely word of mouth or and, and uh, that's the best way especially that's the best way we've not actually invested in any marketing at all yeah and when the first set of customers came in i know that for them to understand this whole concept of what you are trying yeah. to do and of course the pricing is also on the premium side exactly how did they react to this so good bad and ugly you know there are there is a set of you won't believe some people who have actually been coming from the time sequel open and they have been coming consistently probably are there three four times a week You Two know, times a week. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And this is pretty much like their kitchen replacement because they're like, you can't get salads which are completely organic, um, 
also taste delicious you know at this price in your kitchen you you really can't uh, so great things from them and they were like wow there's really nothing like this in the city and then of course it comes with the challenges people who do not understand uh, um you know the taste aspect of it you know they want every like they want salads which are heavily dressed which are loaded with cheese but that's not the whole concept of eating healthy uh, so even though there are people who this may not appeal to but i want to stay very clear to my beliefs and you know what is my food philosophy i don't want to compromise on that so yeah you know there there is a set of people who who may not like this um who want things more dressed up more saucy lots of cheese uh, well that is their idea of being healthy not mine so but i i like i said i want to stick stay too true to my promise um and then some people who probably didn't like it in the beginning but have taken a liking to it now and they they tell me which for me is actually most amazing that they've made this lifestyle choice at home and they eat like this at home you know for for me i think that's really the best feedback and, and i've seen those people over the last 2 years but again right you know getting people to move away from their butter chicken and you to, know the it's the nuns and all of that to this kind of yeah. food is challenging it's super but challenging but putting a staff together to do this must oh, be also oh my equally God. challenging it is right? it's the most challenging thing it sometimes drains you out to get people to work in the kitchen who believe in this because everybody is like you know why should we work in this restaurant we just want to cook butter chicken or a pizza or a pasta or a burger or make a sandwich you know uh, that is actually the most challenging part um, sometimes like i said it's it's super exhausting it's draining but then you know even if half of them actually believe in it and then you you train them over a period of yeah. time you know they get to to believe in this um and then you know like i said because i also spend a lot of time in the kitchen recipe testing so they see me in the kitchen um uh, and when they look at these ingredients they've literally never worked with these ingredients before and they sort of also then respect it after a certain point uh when you came to starting this whole restaurant yeah. idea there must be a lot of self doubt right yeah, because again huge. it is not you're not in this business you're yeah. doing this and then again it's very niche how did you take care of that kind of a situation when you were like you know what the hell are you doing now yes. let's do something else or let's yes. introduce a pizza or, or something else yes. in the menu there was a lot of self doubt like i said a lot of people loved it but a lot of people were like what is this food and what are these price points but then they do not understand the promise of it being genuinely organic and not only organic using the best quality ingredients that there are you know to an extent that we've gone and invested in our own poly house like we bring our cacao from peru we get our walnuts from kashmir you know small details like this using the best quality olive oil you know which is cold pressed which is extra virgin uh, so while i believed in in all this people didn't you know um there was massive amount of self doubt and especially when people said that you know why would people somebody like you rightly said pay so much for a salad or a cookie um you know but i said if i believe in this and i see people on a daily basis who love sequel and i said you know what i just need to focus on the positives not worry about the negatives and just keep going and of and, course um, you know, now that it's been and yoga helps a yeah, lot and now that it's been a success you have started the second branch of that yes. in uh, kala ghoda yes and looks like there'll be more coming up so what is the scaling up plan and when are you taking this to bangalore and delhi and all the other places well a there? lot of people are reaching out to us to take it to bangalore and delhi but no plans as of now um, Uh, currently in, in the process of working on the scaling up plans we haven't finalized anything at the moment but we want to to see what what is it going to be to take it to another level but certainly want to make it more accessible in different micro markets within the city i think there's a huge potential out there amazing yeah. so a couple of questions when it comes to organic an average person doesn't even know what is organic and yes. what is not organic yeah. and we always have this doubt yeah. how does one identify that are they really getting served in organic food so, so unfortunately uh, you know there is no body in india um, other than i'm talking about the fresh produce not the dry ingredients the dry ingredients you get a whole bunch which is usda certified so you know it is certified that's really not the case with the fresh produce and that's actually the unfortunate part of it um, but i think if you cannot afford to buy organic ingredients at least look for ingredients which are naturally grown completely without pesticides you know you should know where your food is coming from and which is one of 
the things that I really want to put out there to people. But how no, do you know? I mean, like you like buy for food example, from a sabzi wala, you right? Buy, yeah, so start going to farmers market, question them. Where does it come from? Talk to the farmer there, you know. Uh, you need to make these. And this is the only reason we started doing our own farmers market because the whole idea is we want people to eat like this at home. So, you know, we have a poly house at this farm called Offerings, which is outside of Purandar. And we know it is genuinely organic. We don't use any pesticides at all. The land's been vacant there for, for a long time before they started the farm. Also, organic also means biodynamic. Are they doing crop rotation, you know, because it shouldn't be the same crop which is there for, for months. You know, there has to be a... the the patch has to be rotated every now and then. So all of this means organic. Uh, it's very tough when it comes to fresh produce. So what I would suggest is when you go out there to buy stuff which is labeled as organic, please, one, read the, the label pack. Secondly, there are people out there. Ask them, question them. You should certainly do that. You know, and like I said, this is the only reason we started doing our own farmers market, where we actually bring in fresh produce on Saturday morning to Bandra uh, at Sequel Bandra, and Sunday morning to Sequel Kala Ghora from the farm, and we we sell that because the whole idea is to make this accessible to people in their homes. The Vishal Gondal Show will be right back after this break. Yeah. It's IBM here, let's go. We the IBM kids on the block over here. Just to talk, taking a break from producing all day. Coming on this podcast because we got stuff to say. IBM Daily is the name of the show. Monday to Friday, we ready to go. Talking about stuff in our head. We might even talk about our favorite bread. Signing out, it's IBM here, the podcast network that's in your ear. Catch IBM Daily Monday to Friday on the IBM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. So at Sequel, the menu is very unique, but there's an equally unique thing of this farmer's market concept. Yes. How did you think about it and how did you execute something as crazy as a market in a restaurant? I mean, this is not what is again normal. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of it came uh, because we want to make this produce accessible to people at their homes you know like I said there are a lot of people who literally eat at sequel three four times a week there are people that you see every single day there are people that you come once a week you know once a month for example but the whole idea is to transform their food habits so that they start eating organic at home and you know which is what I mean so sequel is like their entry into a healthier lifestyle exactly. and then you want them to adopt it themselves themselves you know which is the whole idea so then uh, you know I decided to you know just talk to the farm and say that you know let's scale up the production in a way that we can sell also the produce at the market if not everything at least uh, you know half of the produce that's coming out of the poly house it started from there and anyways you know the kind of ingredients that we use at sequel are so unique like we bring in our fresh walnuts almonds saffron from Kashmir then we work with a whole bunch of other partners where we take the organic dry ingredients for so we said why limit it just to fresh produce Let's you know start yeah. Selling it, yeah so like we sell saffron we sell morels we sell a whole bunch of uh, powders like moringa superfood powders like moringa which people can just put it in their smoothies um so the concept just came from a simple thought that people should adopt this lifestyle every day in their homes you know that that's how it came from and, and, and how did you measure success for something like this um are we seeing those people literally coming every Saturday or every Are Sunday? Are you seeing them actually becoming healthier? My point is that people yes. eating every day, people go and eat every day a pizza hut, right? But that doesn't mean it is <laughs> that, good that, for them. Exactly. Uh, how do I measure it? You know, I now... They're not just customers, you know, it's gone beyond that because I see at least a lot of them I see over three, four times a week. So I talk to them about their lifestyle. For example, all of them are into fitness, one or the other kind of workout, you know, the kind of meals that they are eating at home. A lot of them have started cooking like this at home, you know. I think for me, that is how you measure success that is this their lifestyle at home and you're actually uh, seeing people adopting this yeah, as a lifestyle yeah yeah I'm seeing a lot of people adopting this as a lifestyle and for people who say you know we can't do this at home we'd rather just come to sequel and let this be our kitchen replacement or are probably eating a salad from there four times a week uh, I think that 
That's how you measure success. And the small changes that they've made in their diet, that they've started eating more plant-based or if they're eating, uh, uh, you know, um, animal uh, produced, they're very conscious so about what they're... you do have eggs, you said, right? We do have free-range eggs and then we have wild and smoked salmon. The idea is largely a plant-based diet. Um, we don't have any meat on the menu because, I mean, one, I don't eat it and I believe largely in a plant-based diet. The second is... If you want to eat meat, if it works for you, by all means eat. But you have to be, like I said, you have to ask questions as to where is your food coming from. You know, you you should know about the soil health of the produce, for example. Uh, if you want and, to and eat there meat... There are so many horror stories of, you know, chickens being pumped with hormones. I was just going and, to come into that. You know, if you want to eat chicken, eat it. But look for chicken which is antibiotic-free or hormone-free. Look for meat which is grass-fed. Eat seafood that's wild. and Or if it's farmed, it's not farmed in polluted waters, you know. And, I mean, I, of course, stopped eating all this long back. And that's the reason we don't have this on the menu. Uh, but if you want to eat it, at least be responsible. Make responsible choices. You know, every time you're eating dairy, even though it's too acidic, it doesn't work uh, at least it doesn't work for me and that's what I believe in. If it works for you, but but please look at cheese that's organic, for example, which doesn't even have preservatives or emulsifiers. These are small things. And, you know, for me, this is how I measure success. Like there are a whole bunch of people who've started making these small changes at home. You know, uh, if they're having in the morning, they're having a toast, for example, they're actually having almond butter with it from Sequel. Or they're not picking up a regular muesli, which has a lot of sugar and cornflakes and stuff like that. They're picking up granola from Sequel and they're just making nut milk at home and having this for breakfast, you know. So these small changes that they started incorporating in their daily schedule. So I think have it makes you ever a lot thought that how your childhood in Jammu and the, your upbringing yes. in some way has impacted what you are doing in sequel? Yeah. You no, have... I have thought. I mean, my mother's an excellent cook, but of course she doesn't cook like this. But, you know, if I go back to what I ate during my childhood, one coming from such a small place, it's all organic. You know, there is no concept of using pesticides, for example. Secondly, uh, you know, I was just talking to the, the guys at the farm the other day and I said, when I was living there, I used to eat so many greens that have completely got out of my diet at this point of time because you eat so seasonal there. What you're, One, there is a proper concept of four seasons, which doesn't exist here. So the food changes as per that, you know. what I clearly remember what we ate in the winters was not available to us in, in spring or in summer. So I think I can actually link the food philosophy and everything. It was about eating fresh vegetables, never canned food or pizzas or burgers or anything like that, you know. Um, also, I mean, now, of course, there are these food chains. While I was growing up, there was none like this. And then eating food um, at home, which was produced completely local, super fresh, organic, um, very seasonal. You know, uh, I can actually link the food philosophies that I have now, even though the food may not be the same, but the philosophy is actually, co it's, it's but very what is, similar. what is your comfort food? Uh, my comfort food is actually, I would say my mom's food. Just, I love nadru, um, you know, which is basically lotus root. Uh, I love nadru. I love hak sak. So all these greens, which you don't get, unfortunately, in these Bombay. These are all Kashmiri. These, these are, are all Kashmiri. Kashmiri. Yeah, this is my comfort food. I love hak sak. I love something called uh, fresh bean, which is the fresh kidney beans that you get. Yeah, this is my comfort and food with I, rice. I presume rajma chawal. Yeah, yeah, all of this. But this is my none of this food. is served in sequel. <laughs> yeah, where, where, am I, where am I going to get lotus root? And, you know, I would love <laughs> to use it on the menu. And I would love to actually use these greens. Some of these greens are way more nutritious than kale. But then, of course, they're kale not grown Kale is this here. very American thing. I just can't, don't understand why people in India have started eating kale. It's not local. But, it's you know, if I was, if my restaurant was there, I would actually be, I would be using uh, turnip leaves, uh, for example. I would be using kohlrabi leaves. I would be using haksag. But you just don't have that produce. But we've started growing these at the farm recently. So hopefully we'll have them uh, during the and winter. From a from a business perspective, it said that the restaurant business is becoming tougher and tougher. Yeah. So how are you managing this? It, I mean, it's tough. It's tough for sure. There are no two ways about it. But I think as long as you stay true to your beliefs when it comes to quality and a whole bunch of other beliefs that you have, 
I don't think you need to be worried about if your quality is up there and it's consistent. You know, I think these are the two most key parameters. I think the biggest problem with restaurants is scaling up. You can manage this in two, three branches, but the minute you set up ten, that's when the thing starts breaking down. That that's when the so yeah, that's basically just related to quality. That's when you start compromising on the quality, and that's something we are very clear at Sequel. you know quality and consistency these are the two key parameters this is not something we are going to compromise on we don't take any shortcuts when it comes to that so i mean yeah that's why you can't have 10 uh, so you have to look at other models yeah. of scale so talking about uh, compromises in quality you decided to have your wedding in a little small town yeah. uh, with a very small guest list but yeah. somehow it was covered by the vogue magazine as one of the most happening weddings How did that end up happening? I don't and know. A lot they, of people they, here want to do this, <laughs> and they spend millions for their weddings, but not they're not able to do what yeah. you did. Yeah, it's it's actually quite funny. I was talking to Arjun, who's the publisher, and I was like, "Your team is hounding to cover my wedding." He's like, "Are you mad? Everybody's paying us, and they're hounding you, and you're saying no to them. What is wrong with you?" So you know, they just decided to get in touch with me. I think because they've covered sequel many times. Uh, you know in vogue and they said we'd like to cover your wedding and i was like i i don't understand why and they said no you've been in vogue uh, many times and i think it would be nice to have your wedding and considering it's it's a bit you know the way your wedding has happened it's it's very unconventional um in a small town like that and so this was in dharamshala this was not in dharamshala it yeah, I mean McClure Gunge but yeah. for for the upper way like beyond McClure Gunge in in this place called Naddi so in Himachal which is like super quaint um yeah and the fact that we actually did some ceremonies in Norby Linka Institute which is completely unheard of they've never allowed any wedding or any function for that ma- matter whether it's Tibetan or Indian um there but you know we went there and we fell in love with the place and we decided to get married there and we somehow managed it was my husband i did actually nothing i was not involved and in the wedding at all your husband is not involved in the restaurant business or in he the- actually loves it more than me he's a tax uh, you know he's a tax planner wow <laughs> he's actually a chartered accountant um So you and are the creative, and he's the <laughs> the the finance. Yeah, he actually specializes in international tax, and uh, you know, I mean, he has his own setup. They have their own form, but he comes in the evening. He's there over the weekends. He he's he's also the barista because he loves that's his contribution to sequel. I have nothing to do with coffee, and he actually loves it more than me. He really loves it, and he was the one who pushed me. to start this um and not go back to the corporate world and um yeah so you know he executed the entire wedding uh i don't know how we made it to vogue but then they were like you know we've got to cover your wedding and i just couldn't understand why well but, uh, <laughs> well i'm sure the people out there are already googling you on <laughs> on uh, and finding out more details of your wedding uh but talking a little bit about your own habits and yeah. your own life hacks uh what what have you figured out in all these years tell me three things which have helped you improve your productivity or um, uh, anything else in life which has made it okay. easier okay i think faster. the first thing that has helped me improve my productivity a lot is i would say yoga especially in versions and i would tell everybody out there the first thing in the morning take 20 minutes out for yourself practice shoulder stand headstand handstand the inversions basically reverse the blood circulation send a lot of oxygen to your brain and you know you feel absolutely recharged that's a complete hack huh? so yeah. you know what i've been meaning to do it but now that i've spoken to you, you i'm going to try must, doing this you must yeah. do it the first thing in the morning take 20 minutes and half can, an hour you can like balance on a wall to yeah, start with, yeah yeah right? you know it's okay if you can't balance on by yourself just take the support of the wall and balance and you'll actually feel to you know if you hold the headstand for 5 minutes you hold the shoulder stand for 10 minutes you'll feel just when you get out of it you'll feel super energetic the only thing is don't do it in the evening because it'll keep you awake you'll also realize that you are far more productive um, uh, at work you wow, know wow that's a good one so, so that's that is very important for me and since i'm so into this whole concept of holistic you know i mean and there are days which are super Tough, super stressful, and especially if you're in the restaurant business, long hours. You know, sometimes you have a headache. You're super stressed. For me, the easiest thing is you go home and you light some either lavender candle or smell some lavender oil, just to to completely 
calm down. So recently, uh, I've got this little lavender roll-up, which you can yeah, which pull up is, on your pillow. Yeah, it's or very on good on a lavender mist, for yeah. example. And it helps yeah, you sleep. It helps you a lot, so, you know, yeah, whether people got, believe it or not, but it is super helpful. Lavender has this magic. Yeah. Uh, it can make you sleep, yeah, which is a good and one. And third, yeah. I'm so against the food wastage. So, and I completely believe in route to front cooking. You know, you don't need to waste any part of the food. That's why it's actually on your table. So, I would say that take out all the peels that you normally throw off the vegetable. You don't need to buy a store-bought cube for making stocks. Just store your vegetable peels, the stem that you normally discard. Just throw them all together with water and some seaweed and make stock out of it. You know, I mean, that's what I normally do. And what what is the thing you give people the most? Um, a lot of books. Yeah. And yeah. and which is your favorite book, for example, which? You uh, the book, I mean, one of my favorite books is Food and Healing, which is by Anna Mara Colbin, the, the woman who founded NGI, which is this culinary school in New York. The whole book is actually, it talks about everything that you eat, it impacts your health, which is what I think consumers out there do not understand that, you know, you might indulge in a pizza or you might eat a slice of cake or you'll eat burgers regularly or you'll eat steak thinking, you know what, this is... Some people think, oh, it's good protein. You know, I need to eat this on a daily basis. Uh, You don't know that every single food that you eat, it actually impacts your health. You know, at the same time, yes, it is is about balance. Uh, So for me, that is my favorite book because of a whole bunch of reasons, because of the whole food philosophy. Somebody was actually how, you know, we know about health. Somebody was actually practicing this in New York 50 years back. Wow. You know, the whole concept of eating organic, the whole concept of eating whole foods, eating diet that's balanced, cutting sugar absolutely out of your body. Uh, she was practicing this in uh, New York 50 that's years incredible. back. And, you know, for me, the food, uh, her book is also very interesting. She was vegetarian most of her life. Why I love her book, it also shows you that you don't need to be so rigid about your food ideologies. Like I said, you know, I don't eat meat. I believe in following a largely plant-based diet, but maybe your body needs it. But you need to be careful about where it's sourced from. You know, you need to eat meat that's grass-fed. So her book actually starts on a very interesting note where she's, the first few chapters are devoted to her and her former husband, uh, where she said that while she thrived on a plant-based diet and she never had any issues and she could cure whatever uh, illness she had her husband the moment he went on a plant-based diet within a year he lost tremendous amount of weight he got into depression he just couldn't cope up with it and the moment he started eating meat once a week but sourcing it carefully responsibly you know um, sustainably his health was fine you know so while she promotes a plant-based diet she also gives an example of how it didn't work for her husband and also a very interesting story in her book is a friend who was visiting her from Argentina had a whole bunch of health issues I'm talking about you know 40-50 years back Uh, had type 2 diabetes and therefore was obese Um, was taking insulin shots twice a day so a simple thing people don't realize that food is about healing you know you don't need medicines and that's why I love her book you can actually food hack all this food, food is, is medicine. medicine you can hack these uh, at home and you can start incorporating this so her friend came to stay with her for about two to three weeks she didn't need even one insulin shot she changed her diet her friend's diet completely she removed sugar out of it she gave her a diet which she was cooking at home which was about eating largely plant-based meat only once a week when they went out no alcohol at all and no sugar at all while she was giving her rice cakes it was made with of course an alternative sweetener um and can you imagine somebody who's type 2 diabetes without uh, insulin yeah, wow yeah. That's, that's so, incredible so yeah for, for that reason i just love her book and then of course it has different kinds of diets um, also and how food can be used as medicine you know and why should you be largely eating a plant-based so, diet? so when you travel how do you eat healthy because there's no sequel in other places yet so how do you eat I you know I, I'm actually a sucker for all health food places I've literally seen them in different parts of the world whether it's Bali it's New York it's London it Cape Town just everywhere it's very clear even my husband he has to eat at restaurants which are all about health food and highly focused on quality so i do a lot of research i make a whole list and uh, i go to delhi where do you go and eat 
I haven't been to Delhi in a long time. Oh God! Okay. But uh, yeah, it would be a tough one for me now. Or Where you, would I? Do eat? you carry any food with you? Or? I literally I have sequel granola in my bag. I have sequel granola bars. You wouldn't believe. You know, we were skiing uh, in Srinagar in January and in February. Uh, while everybody was eating on the slopes i had sequel truffles which are basically nuts and seeds you make a truffle just out of nuts and seeds and raw cacao i was i carried sequel peanut butter in the morning to get that boost of energy i had sequel crackers i literally had everything from sequel in my bag so wow. yeah i literally travel with all these things yeah amazing i yeah. wish everybody <laughs> now has a chance of coming to sequel and yes. trying this out yeah vanika it has been an absolute pleasure and i think as we know that in your case there is a sequel and there is going to be a one part after this too so we are yes. looking forward to that absolute pleasure talking to you same here absolutely loved being here thank you thank you so much He bends down to test the warm water for his bath. He comes here to quench his thirst for a hot shower and some podcasts. You can witness how he enjoys having other people talk about cool stuff in his bathroom. Indeed, it helps him with his loneliness. You can find more of his pieces on ivmpodcast.com. Your one-stop destination where you can check out the coolest Indian podcasts. Happy listening.